Let's get it, baby. Welcome to episode 22 of the Masters Muscle Podcast. Icon, legend, inspiration, all words associated with our guest this evening. He has competed in multiple federations, pioneered the mixed pairs landscape, and is an author recently releasing a documentary called Driven, the story of his life. Vinny, who am I talking about this evening? The one, the only, Tony Pearson. I remember, uh, wow. Wow. 1982, I think I walked into the gym for the very first time, and Tony Pearson, Tom Platts, and I believe Arnold Schwarzenegger were the names thrown around for different various reasons, and Tony was uh, probably the one for uh, his symmetry, his balance, and great posing, and I, I learned from you, Tony, how to pose and how to move on stage and present my physique, so thank you so much for coming on tonight. It's like, wow, I'm like a kid in a candy store right now. Thank You're, you. Thank yeah, you yeah. So um, let's go back to the beginning. Let's go before you started getting into competing and what's your story and our fans want to know. Um, and then, you know, we'll segue into other other topics. OK, uh, from the beginning, let's go back to St. Louis. That's where it all started. I was on the wrestling team and I, I went to, to the rest to, to make the wrestling team because I saw Muhammad Ali in person. You know, I was 13 years old and he inspired me to pick up sports. I don't know what. I couldn't play football too slow. <laughs> couldn't play basketball in too short. So but I, but I was pretty strong. I was a strong little kid. So at 16 years old, I made the team uh, well 13. At the time I was 16, I blew my knee out. And um I was training in the weight room in high school, make it short real quick. My wrestling coach came in one day, he says, Hey, you put on some muscles. He's you're starting to grow. I go, yeah, I'm excited, you know. And he goes, you want to go to a real gym? So he takes me to George Turner's gym. I don't know if you heard of George Turner. Yes. He's legendary. And uh, so the first day, I go to go to George Turner's gym, and I'm working out and for about three hours. George was uh, very animated. So he came over to me and go, through curse words, what the fuck do you think you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> you're never going to build any muscles like that. Get into my office. I go, what did I do wrong? And I was 16 years old. I was terrified of this man. And he goes, I'm going to train you. Be here 6 o'clock tomorrow night. And don't be late. And then, so when I arrive the next day, he's very loud. So Joyce looks at me up and down. He goes, we're going to start with those bird legs. It was, <laughs> so it was a squat session. He had me squatting uh, 10 sets of 10, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you know, going up to 350, 350 pounds. I was very strong for a little kid. So that's how it all began. And I was just hooked from that point on. I started, you know, reading the magazines and started dreaming about California somehow, you know, how am I going to get there and what am I going to do? I don't know, know anyone out there. But uh, after about nine months training with George every day, I mean, you can't, he count the reps for you. So he's on top of you all the time. You don't complain. You don't say, I can't, you know, you never see whatever George told me to do, I did. And I, I'm grateful for that because it, it, it taught me discipline. He was preparing me for the trip to California. That's what he's really doing. And he was trying to see if he could break me. Because typically you swing legs twice a week. You don't go three times a week. But he threw that extra day in there just to see what I was going to do. Am I going to bail out? I mean, I couldn't get out of the car. But, you know, by the third, <laughs> third session, I couldn't get out of the car. But, you know, that's that's how it began. And I, I told George one day after nine months, you know, I've been reading the magazines and I saw Arnold and I saw all these guys. I knew the names already. I said, I'm going to Cal I'm going to move to California. And he just lost it. You got to tell you, lost your mind. He goes, <laughs> slams the door down his desk, stands up, yells at me. There's kids with arms, you know, they got 15 inch, 15 inch arms bigger than yours. You're never going to make it out there, is what he said. So, so the next day he came over and says, Well, if you're going to go out there, Go down to Gold's Gym in Venice. And Venice has stayed in my head. I don't know why. It says, Venice, California. Wow, it sounds exciting, you know, from St. Louis. And uh, look up Ken Waller and tell him, yes. tell him I sent you. You know, he had five champions. Dave Draper. No, he had uh, uh, Samir Manute and myself and uh, Ken Waller and a couple of other guys. Um, Phil Williams. 
coming out of his gym. We all went to California. But he knew if you're going to be a champion, you got to go to California. It's not going to happen in St. Louis. No photographer is going to come in the gym or Joe Weider looking for you in St. Louis. So um, it was the right decision for me, but I just felt an urgency that I had to get out of town. It was time to go. And I just felt it in my heart. And I told my sister that I was leaving. She's, you know, she's bawling. Don't leave me. Who do you know? No one. What are you going to do? I don't know. I'll figure it out when I get there. <laughs> so wow. So when you're 19 years old, you have no fear. It's like, now I don't want to go anywhere. I've got a lot of fear. So, <laughs> so yeah, I took a one-way trip on a bus. And I said, I'm not coming back. And I meant it. I thought I live wow. or die in LA. This is it. So and I almost almost made I almost lost it. I mean, it was, you know, I was this close, not making it, just that close. But the grace of God, I somehow survived. And you know, you know, once I got into Ghost Gym, I got thrown out of the original Ghost Gym. Quick story here. I want to oh, hear this. <laughs> <laughs> First day, well, I was supposed to go to Muscle Beach. I said, no, I want to go to Ghost Gym. You know, so I walked in that day. It, I think it was like a month before the Olympia. We had Frank Zane. Joe Weider was training Frank Zane. Ken Waller was sitting over there. He had Robbie Roberts, Emmanuel Perry. I mean, the list, Bill Grant, the list goes on. So I'm sitting in the corner just watching these guys. Wow, man. Look at these guys. They train like machines. No one was talking. No one's drinking water. There is no, you know, when you train with pros, there's nothing to talk about. Yep. You talk when we're done. You drink your water when we're done. So I was witnessing this and and all absorbing. All, I'm very, you know, I'm very in tune. And it was very serious. I mean, they had just this angry look on their face. They're training for contest, Mr. Olympia. His arms are like this. And I'm going, oh. I'm sitting there going, God, if I train, I believe in myself. If I train hard enough, I think I look like these guys someday. And that's what I said. So about, about half an hour of doing this, the um, the manager. Looked over, he says, hey, kid, get over here. So I go over to him, and he goes, um, you want to buy a membership? I go, I don't have any money. Can I train for the day? And then I said, "Was is Arnold here? And he goes, uh, he was here a couple hours ago. So this guy was, and I was like, who is a stupid kid? He said, where are you from? I said, from St. Louis. And he said, well, you, you can't hang around the gym. So he walked me to the front door and kicked me out. <laughs> oh, no. So that's how it started. I went down to Muscle Beach and... Once again, you know, the guy said, oh, it's three dollars for the week. I don't have the three dollars. <laughs> I'm trying to eat. He goes, Okay, leave a little suitcase here. You can go train for free. So he let me work out on Muscle Beach in the sun. It's like a hundred degrees every day, you know, blitzing. But it was so packed with people from all over the world. I mean, bodybuilding at the time was so new mm -hmm. and so interesting. You know, people couldn't understand why they're lifting weights and looking in the mirror at themselves and and, you know, back in St. Louis, they thought, you know, you're gay, he's crazy. I get it all the time. Why do you lift weights every day? Because I enjoy it. And I see my body's changing. So I train out there, and I don't want to tell the whole story because all this is in the book. But that's how I got to California, and that's how um, I was inspired by Muhammad Ali. And George Turner just kind of picked up on it. You know, I, was, you know I, was, I just feel that I'm grateful and blessed to get this man out of the whole state to be interested in some stupid kid, you know, soaking wet, made 150 pounds. But I think he saw something. And I, you know what I mean? So that's, without him, I would never have made it because I don't know how to train my legs. I didn't, you know, genetically, I don't have the great legs. I had the balance and proportion, but I didn't have the size on the legs. So that's where George took you to the deep water to see if you're going to quit or not. Don't waste my time. That, you know, that was his attitude. Uh, you do it or you can get out. And when was when did you think about actually entering your first contest? Well, I was training, working out on Muscle Beach, and I, you know, I got to mention Arnold's name because you know he discovered me there, and uh, mm -hmm. that stuck in my head because I'm wait a minute, I said, wait a minute, the best guy on the planet said I can be a world champion. This is what he told me. So I believe that because, of course, all the critics around me said you're never going to be anything. So, you know, you hear mm -hmm. that 24 hours a day. But, but I always remember back what Arnold said. He said I could be a champion. So I won Mr. Venice Beach. My, my training partner on the beach says, hey, man, Mr. Venice Beach is coming up in a couple of weeks. You should enter. I did two shows back in St. Louis. And the Mr. Missouri I came fifth, I think sixth. And then that one came in third, Mr. Mr. St. Louis, the third, something like that. But then I got to L.A. and I said, well, I want to, he said, compete. I said, okay, I, I won Mr. Venice Beach. 
So that was my first win, 1976, Mr. Bennett's Beach. Had my little wow. trophy. Didn't ever put it down. I was holding the trophy the whole time. <laughs> it's funny. And then I said, I don't know what where this came from. I just said to a bunch of people, including my training partner, in two years, I'm going to be Mr. America. Just like that. And they go, sure. Now they're laughing, of course. Everyone's laughing. So that's, yeah. So yeah, that's, right. that's what inspired me to continue on. You know, I, you know, I, I, I trained for myself. I went to the gym in the high school, Turner's gym, wherever it was. I was training for me because I enjoy working out. It was just it was a lot of fun. You watch your body change and lift heavier weights. I was pretty strong. You know, challenging the other guys at the gym. You know how we are. And um, so that's, even now I train for myself. Even though I made a career out of it, but I go to the gym, and, I, and during my career, they always call me Mr. Overtrain. Tony, if you just cut back a little bit, don't train twice a day, da, 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 da. I knew my body. I knew I, I have to train twice a day if I want to be at my best. If I want to be razor sharp, really cut, muscle striations on top of striations, that takes a lot of work. And twice a day and i was very lucky once again to train with the great legendary robbie robinson wow so, wow yeah so i'm at gold's gym it had moved to santa monica now so i uh, and, and this guy named kent keen i don't know if you know who kent keen is. sure okay he was a manager there and uh super nice guy he saw i was starving i was living on tuna fish and water so he let me train for free you can train go ahead so and then he started helping, helping me with my posing a little bit. And then, like I said, I got to train with Robbie Robinson. And uh, this was amazing. I was watching this guy for like a year and a half sitting in the corner. I said, oh, my God. He had two training partners. He, he, he's destroying them. Trust me. There was no mercy from this guy. So, you know, he's, what, 30 years old at the time? Robert's at his prime time. Even though he was, you know, not winning the Olympia, what I thought he should have won, Mr. Olympia. And... Um, I started training with Robbie. He taught me a lot. He taught me a lot about form, technique, mental focus, uh, you know, just everything. And, and I was standing and watching him. Like I said, I'm very intuitive. I was watching him do his set one day. He had 505 on the, on the deadlift. He, he pulls it up. He got it to his knees, and he lost his balance a little bit. So he took one step forward, next step, and pulled it all the way up. Wow. And I looked at him. I go, that's what this is. It's all mental. Bodybuilding is mental. Yeah. You're so in tune to that muscle, and the world don't exist. That's that's what I learned, and I've been practicing that ever since. You know, when I'm trained, I don't talk to anybody. I got the hood on. I'm in the corner. I don't want to see you between sets. I'm looking at the floor. How can I correct the, what? I, make the mistakes. What what did I'm doing wrong? So it's a it's a. I try to teach my clients it's mental. Focus on the muscle. It's not about how much weight you're lifting. You're going to get stronger as you go, of course. But form is everything for me. So, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so, that's, how, that's how the whole thing came about. And, and training with Robbie is very inspirational. So in a few years, couple of years, I did win Mr. America. So I, I ended up at Gold's Gym, back at the Gold's Gym. I'm very, you know, I don't know. I, I think I was feeling myself that day. And he, not training really hard. And Robbie came over. I just heard this voice in the back, and he goes, TP. Get the fuck to work. You ain't did shit. And he turned and walked away. So from that moment, I realized I had done nothing. I wow. want to be a world champion. I got to really get to work. And that's what he meant. Stop BSing. You ain't did shit. So that's how he does that, Rob. He's a man of few words, but he still cool. always has the right things to say in a very few words. So, yeah. He's another one that's an inspiration in the 70s, still looks phenomenal. Jeez. Yeah, he's like 77, 76 years old. Yeah, exactly. That's nuts. That's insane. Right. So he's been doing it from the early 60s. So, And so now you've written a book. You did a documentary with Andrew here. Um, take us into that. Andrew. <laughs> Hey, Tony, how's it going? How you doing, buddy? <laughs> so, Andrew, what is so? Are you the I and I apologize. So, are you the producer or exactly? You've been very kind while we've been talking with Tony, but please. Yes, I know. Who is this guy in the corner over here, along with Tony? Tony's the the actual star. Where Tony's on this? Side. <laughs> no, I'm not. No, I'm not. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I'm the actual the director of the documentary for uh, Driven 
uh, the Tony Pearson story. It's actually based on his memoir that he wrote. Um, so everything that you read in his book, it comes to life in the documentary. There is a visual aspect to what you see. And when you read that book, the way that Tony writes, it's very visual. It's almost, to me, it almost feels like a movie every single chapter of that book. And I just thought we have to tell this story in some way. This is an incredible story. It reaches, you know, not just the bodybuilding audience, but it reaches all kinds of audiences. It's, it's a book for everyone. Everyone can relate to this story in some way. And how did you guys meet? So we met through a mutual friend, uh, Steve Cartwright. Um, so Tony had just come out with his book and he was uh, looking to do an audiobook version of it. Um, and he, uh, our friend Cartwright actually connected us because he was like, hey, uh, I know you guys, can you guys do an audiobook? And we, like, we don't really do audiobooks, but sure, we'll give it a shot. It's COVID. You know, the pandemic, everything shut down. We don't have anything else to do. We'll, we'll give it a shot. Sure. Um, and, uh, so we buy a copy of the book, we read it and we, turns out it's an incredible story. And literally within weeks of us getting connected, Tony is going on stage for his final, uh, competition. And I, I didn't know what I was going to do with this footage, but I packed up my bags and I drove down to Vegas and I filmed his final, uh, retirement, uh, competition show and um, I, at the time I didn't know what I was going to do with the, with the footage I just knew that it felt important to kind of document that at the time and that was 2020 that, that was, was 2020. 2020 yeah okay and you've never had been involved in bodybuilding at all at this point no up until this point uh, I had not really had an interest in you know anything you know beyond you know the very uh the surface level oh Schwarzenegger, uh, you know, okay. that's bodybuilding. You know, I had no idea going into this whole world. However, I knew that the story was important enough that I had to sit down. I had to do my homework. I would have weekly phone calls with Tony, um, you know, just to get me up to speed about his life, about, you know, the world of bodybuilding. If there's terminology or things that bodybuilders do that I didn't necessarily understand, you know, I would have these weekly phone calls with him to just open up my mind and actually educate me on the whole sport itself. And so um, I took, you know, something that could have been a disadvantage of like coming in and just knowing nothing about the sport. And I made it an advantage uh, in the fact that, you know, I felt that this documentary could be accessible to everyone. You know, it's not just for people who are into the sport of bodybuilding. Anyone can come into this uh, movie and pick it up and actually understand not just his story, but the actual sport itself as well. So, Tony, what was the impetus of writing a book? Had you been journaling for years or just said, I'm going to pen a memoir? What was the thoughts behind it? No, honestly, I got to California and I had a very rough childhood. Mm -hmm. Very rough. And I said to myself, well, you know, because I was in the magazine a few times and I read the articles about myself. So, wow, this is really nice. But I said, I, I'm never going to tell anyone about my past, where I came from, what I went through. They don't, they don't need to know this. It's embarrassing. I'm insulted by it. It's, I said, I'm just going to keep, I'm going to take it to my grave. That's what I said. I'm going to take this to my grave. And um, so I had a lunch with a friend one day, and I just sit there telling her about, I went through this as a child, blah, blah, blah. She goes, you need to write a book. That's all she said. You need to write a book. And I went home and I started writing that day. So wow. I, mean, I had the whole career. So when I finished the book, published it, and all the insiders that know me for 40 years, they've known me, and they go, oh, my God. We had no idea. Wow. We didn't know you at all. We don't know anything about you. You know, I was engaged, and I had girlfriends. They don't know anything about my life as a child coming up, nothing. Wow. Okay. I really kept that close to my chest. But then I said, you know, maybe I can inspire other people and help other people. I was a kid. This is a tortured child. So maybe I can help some kids out there to show yeah. them that, hey, you, you can survive. You don't need to be taking drugs and running with gangs and doing all the bad stuff. I mean, you can find something that you enjoy doing. 
I did I was mm-hmm. bodybuilding or dance or football or whatever it is, and and focus on that. That that's going to motivate you. So yeah, I said maybe I can help somebody just to tell my story. And before I published a book, I would I would tell people at the gym. I got brave enough to say, well, when I was a kid, this happened. And then within 30 seconds of me telling them, they would tell me the worst thing that's ever happened to them. Mm-hmm. And I go, right. I'm onto something here. I mean, you know, we're best friends now. I can tell, I can, I can tell you what, what my dad did, my my brother did, and you know what I mean? So I knew I was on to something. But like you said, the way I wrote it, I tried to write it to where I put you in the room. I put you in that situation. I talk about Venice Beach. I take you to Venice Beach. You think you were at Venice Beach. And down south in Memphis, and I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, in the deep south, and all the things I went through there. I don't want to give the story, but I had a very tortured childhood, and mm-hmm. uh, somehow I survived it. So, yeah, I wrote the book. I had no idea how to write a book. Really? Me? Writing a book? <laughs> Are you kidding? I'm body book. I don't want to read a book. But I got this girl. She's this lady. A friend, through a friend, she says, I have this lady. She's from England. I said, Okay. She's going to be a ghostwriter. Oh, look, okay. So halfway through, when I'm reading that she wrote, I go, I can't use this. I sound British. So, <laughs> <laughs> so an African-American kid from the South, now, now I'm British. So I had to let her go. And then um, I said, I got to finish this book. So now this is the bodybuilding mode came back in. I'm going to finish this book. I don't care how I do it. It's going to get done. And I got to do it my way. It's got to be my words. So I had um, people to to uh, you know proofread it, two separate people. They missed all they missed all the wrong things. They didn't get it right. So now it's really up to me. Oh, I geez. can't publish this. I spent a lot of money to get to try to get this done, and uh, I finally did it. I, you know, it, 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 it four o'clock in the morning. I was in the emergency room with a nervous breakdown. That's what that book did to me. It was, yeah, it's was, it was 2019. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that it's story everything does. I had mentally. See, this is mental, you know, working out is all physical. This is mental to write this thing and to bring up those old memories. Once you start writing, all that stuff comes back. You yep. know, you face it face to face and you go, Well, then the days I was re- writing about bodybuilding it was fun. Oh, I'm going to make a contest, da da da. But the days I was tortured, I was crying as I was writing. Mm. So that yeah, because you just you're, you're reliving it, you're reliving. It. And when I did the audio book, I was really reliving it, because I got to say the words, mm. I got to read the lines. So yeah, that's it's, it's it. You know, we all have issues. So people say, well, everybody got story to tell. Yes, they do, but they don't tell the story. And so I said, I want to be the one that to, you know reach out to people and see if I can help somebody. I could save one kid, one adult, because adult adults have problems too. You know, they don't face them. They just put them in the closet and you know, lock the key, throw it away. So yeah, it, it was um, very, very challenging to write the book. I still can't believe I wrote the book, and I and I really feel that it's a higher it was a higher power writing for me because I would get up every morning. This is what was going on. I had clients all day. I was training twice a day myself. And, you know, I was getting for a contest <laughs> at the same time. So I'm sleeping four hours a night. But every morning I would get up, the first thing I do is start writing because I was, my mind was fresh. But it was coming to me so fast, I couldn't get on the paper fast enough. And mm. then I go, okay, this is not me. This is a higher power telling me to do this because it just flowed. It was just, there was very few times where I would have to sit and go, okay, what am I going to say here? That's typical me. What am I going to write here? But like I said, it just came so fast. It was so easy to do. And then me personally, I said, well, I just want to make sure they can feel what I feel. They should cry. They should be happy. They should feel sad. They should feel sorry. They should feel all these emotions. That's what I was writing. That's what I was trying to get. I hope I got that. So my my question to you, Tony, is um, so you guys meet up, you team up. And you start talking about doing it as an audio. Yes. And did you start that and then f- realize, wait, we need to do a documentary instead? No, no, it was totally separate. I, um, we, Andrew and, and, you know, and the production company got this girl to, to help me do the audio book. 
I mean, I'm recording this stuff. <laughs> I recorded that audio book in my closet with clothes around me. <laughs> wow. I had, I had my Mac. I had a microphone. This is another thing I have never done in my life. Big How budget. am I going to sit in a closet and record this? I hate my voice. So, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I talked to some people in LA before I met Andrew about doing this. And he said, well, we want $750 an hour. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's what they said. I go, what? That's out. So then I go, I cannot do that. There's no way I could write, I could do this audiobook. I don't like my voice. I don't know how to do it. And then one day it just hit me. You can do it. Do the first line. Do the first chapter. You can do it. Use your own voice. People, they, and I think people want to hear my own voice. Yeah, definitely. It's a little bit more personal that way too, I feel. Yes. Yeah, so it took a long time. It was, it was, it was not easy. Because when you're recording, I didn't know when you record that you can hear that with your tongue or this. You hit something or the scratch or yeah. the airplane overhead, the neighbor's mm -hmm. dog barking. Yes, it picks up everything. So, and then if you miss a word, you just didn't say the word clear enough. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. So it was really, really, it was more challenging than writing the book because my voice is my mm -hmm. voice. When people listen to your voice, your voice says a lot. Especially in the car and you turn it on, you go, oh, he was tired that day. Oh, you can hear it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I can hear the airplane. Oh, I can hear this. So we got to make sure everything is perfect. Everything is perfect. So it's, that was the greatest challenge. Now, Andrew, is this your first documentary? So this is my first feature long documentary. I've done a lot of kind of smaller documentaries in the past. So I, I've gained some experience in that sense. But this was the first time that you know, I did something this big and this, it, it took this long amount of time. I, we spent about two and a half years actually crafting the whole film together. And uh, part of that was, you know, not just like finding the budget and going out and shooting things as we flew out to uh, Memphis, we flew out to St. Louis to these different locations. Um, but it was also a lot of just emotion and trying to craft a lot of the same things that Tony did in the book. Um, because, you know, I, Tony is a full fleshed person, you know, he's not just like the, Oh, here, you know, he's had a tough life, but Oh, woe is me. There are these funny moments. There are these uh, happy moments and sad moments. It's a full roller coaster of emotion all throughout the entire film. And, you know, part of that, that was part of my reason to actually have, weekly phone calls because I knew that the first part of this movie, the first part of this whole story is so emotionally heavy. It's a very dark, deep, weighty topic to try to even tackle. Um, and it can be uncomfortable at times. And there are some moments in the documentary where you may feel a little uncomfortable. You may squirm a bit in your seat because it's just such a really uncomfortable subject to try to dive into um but it it's a level uh, you know the phone calls was trying to have a level of trust with tony because when you try to retell these stories uh these very dark these very traumatic stories you need to have trust that that other person is going to you know tell that story with the the justice that it deserves were you doing this during covid or was this post covid so part of it was, uh, was during COVID, um, the retirement competition, uh, that was what kicked off the entire documentary. So that was in COVID. Uh, it went through 2021. And I think the last uh, interviews we shot were in early 2022. So okay. that's, uh, yeah, that's the whole kind of timeline. And then, of course, uh, over a year and a half of just editing the film, getting it all ready and we have hundreds and hundreds of hours of unused media and footage but you know i'm i'm really happy with the the final movie that we came out with now tony so, go ahead Sean. so tony you're, you're writing the book and obviously it's bringing up a lot of a lot of emotion and whatnot when the book is finally completed and published did it feel cathartic did you feel like a weight was lifted off you that's what i was just gonna ask <laughs> yes absolutely i i said finally i'm free now I'm really free. Because when you're hiding something, you know, you're, you're faking. And I'm not a fake. I'm, I'm pretty straightforward. 
but that was such a tr traumatic thing to go through growing up and being in California and, and all the writers taking all these writing these wonderful things about you and know, go, that's not even me. They have no idea who I am. So yeah, I felt completely free. I told this I told my story. I remember my friend was helped me to load it, upload it that day, and she says, and I go, wait a minute. Yeah, uh, you want me to hit the button? I go, okay, do it. Because you don't know, <laughs> you don't know what kind of feedback you're gonna get. You know, the crit is gonna come out hard and swinging hard. So I said, go ahead, do it. So uh, it turned out okay. I got some pretty good reviews. And uh, of course, you're going to get some negativity. It always comes with it. But um, I, I, I think it was okay. I think it's okay. Yeah, it's, 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 it was relief. It's like, oh, my God. The world knows now. And it's what's the big deal? We all have something going on. And where, where can people find the audio? On Amazon. It's on, on Amazon. Amazon. Yes. Okay. Uh, driven. Yeah, my secret, un, my un secret untold story. Yes, on Audible and on Kindle, Amazon. Go out there, go, 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 read it. It's a really good book. You know, I'm glad you said that, uh, Andrew, uh, Andrew, because uh, it's not just for bodybuilders. People say, "Oh, he wrote a bodybuilding book." No, it's not. I had to include bodybuilding because it's part of my life. The book is about me growing up in the South and uh, what I went through. You know, my, mother, my mom and my dad and my aunt and, you know, poor and black and the whole thing. I mean, it was just, it never, it was never ending. So that's what the book is really about. You know, I had a friend, she was skimming through the book one day and she threw the book across the room. She goes, I don't want to read it anymore because it was bringing up her memories of her okay. past, things that she had gone through. And everybody who reads that, they said, oh yeah, I can relate to this part of the story. I can relate to that part of the story because it happened to me. So that's so that's what he's saying. You can, anybody can relate to this. I mean, the bodybuilding is fun stuff, and people get educated by it. We had the premiere. We had the premiere of this of the book of the movie. And Andrew, you want to tell them about the, the, the premiere? Yeah. So we premiered the movie at the uh, Chinese theater in Hollywood. So that was really cool. Um, it was really funny because there was another photographer that came to support a different uh, movie and he saw Tony there and he's like, oh, my gosh, I know Tony. I wish I, I, I would have known that it was premiering here. I would have brought all my friends to come watch the movie. Um, but it was a, a really fun uh, premiere. Um, I think Tony, you know, he was in the seat. He was crying. It was amazing because it was <laughs> there are so many uh, great moments in that film. And it's it's really there's something in that movie for everybody. And, you know, just like Tony saying, you know, I'm I'm trying to recreate a lot of the same emotions that he's getting out of the book. And so the documentary and the book, I feel like they really complement each other very well. So if you read the book, you got to see the documentary. You see the documentary, you got to read the book. It's like you need you need both. You can't just have one of them. Now, without spoiling anything, is there anything you can share? Anything you can disclose just to give it a little teaser? If not, we totally respect that. You know, we won best documentary. Yes. Wow. That is true. So of that film festival of where we premiered, uh, we won the best uh, documentary uh, overall, um, just Excellent. like uh, just like Tony won overall Mr. America 1978. <laughs> um, so I will say um, that Driven is going to get distributed sometime this year. I can't disclose too much information about that, but it is coming this year some somewhere to the streamers i'm not totally uh i'm, I'm kind of contractually bound for the moment to not say too much there but it's coming all right cool cool there was an interesting story i was watching john hansen's podcast recently and i'm gonna paraphrase a little bit that you folks were maybe in second queue and the people watching before the audience was getting ready to leave, stuck around for just a few minutes and kind of got captivated and stayed for your movie as well. If I remember something along those lines. Yeah. So uh, there was another documentary that um, opened in front of uh, of Driven 
and it was a short one and it was uh you know a, a few people were in the back that came to support that documentary and they were just gonna leave right after that documentary and um apparently they came af up to us after the the screening was over and they said you know we were about to leave but within like four seconds of actually seeing this movie we had to sit down. We were already, we were caught. We, you hooked us in and we had to see where this movie was going. So um, that's, I, I feel like that's kind of the power of the, this documentary. You know, there are some things from the book. There are some things that we, uh, that are exclusive to the documentary itself. Um, but it's, it's a really, really good. I, I would want to say like a human story. You know, there's that bodybuilding element, but there's also this incredible human story of just determination and perseverance. Is, is this anything you can put into like Cannes or Tribeca? I don't know the logistics of those type of film festivals. Yeah, so Cannes is uh, already uh, happening right now. So unfortunately, oh, uh, we can't go to that one. Uh, we did go to Tribeca. Um, Tribeca, uh, unfortunately, we got rejected out of that festival. A lot of the bigger festivals are a little political in that sense where you need to know somebody on the inside kind of a thing. And, you know, you got to shake hands, kiss some babies, all that kind of stuff. Um, but we were fortunate enough that, you know, uh, a distributor um, saw the movie and uh, we actually talked to a couple distributors and they were just captivated with the documentary. And so we were kind of fortunate in that we were uh, we had a couple of options of who we wanted to, you know, best represent the movie, you know, getting it out there in the world. Awesome. So fast forward now, getting back into bodybuilding a little bit, segue into that again. Um, a lot of our viewers love to know what the guys in the 70s and 80s ate and how they trained. So if you could go back in a time capsule, in a <laughs> sense, would you do anything different knowing how bodybuilding has evolved today with how nutrition has evolved and the supplements have evolved? And I'm talking over-the-counter supplements. Right. And how uh, someone... So my brother-in-law met you a long time ago. Um, he was going to school at Life Chiropractic College. I think his friends, Dave, the Popkins had invited you to their house to stay while you were doing some guest posings or something. It was a long time ago. Wow. And, and do you remember this? No. <laughs> no? no. So they, they told me, they told me that, you ate very little and trained a lot. That's exactly it. I'm not a big eater. And uh, I, I don't know how I put on muscle because I was not eating enough, but training like a madman. So I, you know, just genetics. I mean, I just throw it back and say it's all genetics because I was, I'm still not a big eater. Thank God. I mean, people who like to eat, that's the problem. <laughs> but you had, all, but, but even though you weren't a Lee Haney, you still had a lot of muscle. Yes. And I realized that when I went to a chiropractor once, he's adjusted to me and he goes, dude, you got a lot of muscle on such a little frame. He couldn't, you know, he couldn't believe it. So yeah, I had a lot of muscle packed on and I was living on tuna fish and, you know, the guys in those days, it was a lot of red meat, you know, mm -hmm. they were drinking milk, you know, it, was, it just, that's what just loading up on, um, protein shakes, of course. And, uh, it was, it was more, more of just meat. Just me. It wasn't. A, it was. It was just very simple stuff. But we didn't know, you know. Just get as big as you can and train as hard as you can. And then when it come down to the diet, they would go on zero carbs. I mean, mm -hmm. those top pros at the time. It's, that's how they got so cut. You know, you train twice a day, eating eating a lot of meat, so you hold on to your muscle size, and but you don't have any. You don't have carbs. And did you do a lot of cardio? I didn't know cardio. So maybe training twice a day. That was my cardio. That was your cardio. When you train with Rob and these other pros, you got a minute rest between sets or less. So wow. they kept telling you intensity level got to be this high. You got to stay that high all the way through. You know, these guys now are talking about two-minute breaks between sets. You know what I said? I said a boxer get punched in the face. He gets one-minute break in the corner. 
He, he can, he's going to get in the punch in the face again. One minute to recover. You're getting your ass kicked. Bodybuilder yeah. go sit on the bench and check their phone. No, it, it, there's intensity. Yeah. Intensity is what gives you that shape and conditioning. And it shows on stage. It's like you carved out a stone because you can tell this man has worked his ass off. Like Albert Beckles and Robinson and, 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 and Arnold. You know, they said Arnold go throw up and come back and he finished his set. There was no talking. There was no water drinking. You can drink. I was Robbie said you can drink water when we're done. That's and crazy. Then, That's crazy. So it was, it was so intense, but I loved every second of it. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you did. I was excited. You know? I, I I started out at um, Billy's Gym in Bayonne, New Jersey, and uh, it was a hardcore gym, and I got the same environment, same kind of attitude, and and it's hard for me today to like talk to the young guys today and get them inspired or not inspired but just like put a little fire under their ass and they're looking at me like i'm crazy yes and that's bodybuilding if you're serious about it there's got to be some fire some intensity you don't have intensity you don't get in shape and i realized at one point i was trying to do one today ago that doesn't work and, and arnold was a scene because he started training with uh ed corny i think it was draper didn't want to go twice today so that's why he would train with ed corny but arnold was training twice a day I mean, that's how you're really in top condition. I mean, you, you your carbs are super low, you're killing yourself with the weights, and you're living on protein and some veggies. You now, know, or earlier, you and I discussed just briefly about being a little older and uh, recovery and rest. So do you find yourself now training less, or have you scaled back? I have scaled way back. Once a day. Uh, sometimes once every other day I work out and not as hard and, and for sure not as heavy because you got to listen to your body. If you want to continue on, you got to be smart. You know, I kind of miss doing that crazy stuff. And I see guys at the gym that think they're showing me, I said, whatever you're doing, I've done. So you listen to <laughs> it. I did it. You bench, I did it. So I mean, I got one plate on the bar. Now this girl was training next, next to me one day. She looked over at me cause I got the one plate. She's got two plates <laughs> and she smiled. I go, how do you have no idea? Whatever. <laughs> so you don't know what, so, I have, you don't know so I have a question for you, Tony, okay. and it goes back to me a little bit. Uh -huh. So I've been doing this a long time, but I never had the opportunity to step on an Olympia stage. Okay. And in 12 weeks, I'm going to Romania to compete myself at the Masters Olympia. I got awesome. Invited. Yes. Now, I'm finding that I'm needing like three days rest. Two days is not enough. So when you were going into your last show, you're obviously a little older now. Did you say, I have to stick with what I've always done? Or did you just say, I'm listening to my body and I'm going to adapt? Okay, I'm glad you asked that because that, that was year 2020. So right. I, didn't let, I didn't let COVID disturb me at all. There was no gym, but I walked through lunges, walked the park, do push-ups, had two dumbbells at the house. So for four months, five months, there was no gym. So when the gyms came back, I was still still focused on the contest in November. I'm going to do the show. But then as I start preparing for the show, I realized that I'm not getting in shape. Metabolism is slowed down, way down. And in my neck, I had a pinched nerve in my neck. And I, couldn't even, I couldn't even flex. I could train, but I couldn't flex. <laughs> so I had a guy working on that, try to leave that, and um, – yeah, I was training twice a day. I continued to do what I always did, but I think it was kind of a mistake. I went 17 weeks twice a day for that last show, 2020. And how many days a week would you take off? Oh, none. None? It was straight through. So wow. I kind of destroyed You're myself. a machine. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Machines on the side of the road. <laughs> you so get yeah, to see part of that machine show. in the documentary, though. Yeah, he did such a great job of showing the pain and the suffering. I was 60, what, 63? Yeah. 63, yeah. Yeah. But the pain and the suffering, the agony I was going through day by day, twice a day. And you can't miss, because if I miss a workout, I go, my competitor's training to kick my butt. So that's the motivation. Keep going. I don't care if you drop, just keep going. And, and twice I quit. Halfway through, I go, I can't do this. I'm 63 years old. I, I need to back off. It's, I'm, I've got body fat here. It's not coming off. And then I said to myself, in the mirror, people talk to themselves. I go, you have never you never stopped before. You're not going to quit now. And that got me back into the game. So twice I said, I can't do this. Forget it. So luckily I stuck with it. 
and he got it on film. So I was in a lot of pain. Uh, you know, I could barely flex bicep, do the most muscular pose for sure. And I was exhausted. I was tired. I was, and I have no carbs. You know, we have no carbs, but it's like day. You got to go squat. Mm-hmm. You walk into the gym oh, like yeah. a zombie. <laughs> you know, you're not a feeling. But I, I, you know, I think I did okay. I think my body fat was down about 3%. So no cardio. The only cardio we did back in those days in the 70s was going down to Santa Monica. There's those, those, those stairs. You go like yeah. 200 stairs going up and down. It was quiet down there in those days. I mean, so Robbie, he's crazy. He'll grab a 100-pound barbell, and he'll walk down the stairs holding it like this. And <laughs> yeah. And then, and then wow. he run up the stairs with Barn in his back. So I'm trying to keep up with Robbie. <laughs> He's 10 years older than me. So that was the only cardio that we, you know, always did. From the step climber or, or the bike treadmill, no, no, no. Just train. If you train with some intensity, you're going to leave that gym exhausted. You're going to feel the pain. And between session, between workout, I would go home and crash. I got to go to sleep. And then five o'clock, you're back at the gym to repeat it. You know, this wears you down because you do this for about three or four months. We did it all year long because I had to be in shape because if the phone rings, that might be a seminar or an exhibition. If you're not in shape, you don't get to work. So I had I was in shape all the time. I was known to be in shape. So that's your, your training twice a day. That was that was it. So and, and during your career, you had some pretty cool uh, experiences with um, mixed pairs. Yes, and, and, and how that came about, I was in some airport and Wayne D'Amelia, you know Wayne D'Amelia? Yes. Mm-hmm. Right, he, he, he called me, he says, hey, we need one more couple competitors in the contest coming up, mixed pairs. And I'm like, you know, I, you know, really quick, let me run back to Lisa Lyon. You know who Lisa Lyon is? Yes. Sure. Okay, her and I was the first bodybuilders, female guy about to pose on stage together woman actually flexing her muscles because back in the 70s the, the girl thing was not good in bodybuilding but ken sprague's who owns those gym he says i want you to pose with lisa at the mr la you won it last year and now we want you to guest pose i said i'm not going to do it no way so he convinced me to do it and her and i was the first couple on stage posing and lisa's an artist so she said this is what we're going to do we're going to get the dark, dark stage, two spotlights, and a saxophone player in the background. The hardcore fans in those days in L.A. was, I mean, hardcore. They're screaming their heads off. And, and so in the middle of the routine, I go, this is a bad mistake. You couldn't hear a pin drop. I go, this is not good. <laughs> but I could finish the routine, got a standing ovation. The wow. crowd went ballistic. It was just insane. That was the first nice. time in a cup. That was mixed pairs. Fast forward, when Wayne called me, I knew what mixed pairs was, but he said, Once you go to California, I want you to train, work with this girl named uh, Shelly Brule. You know, mm-hmm. her and Jim Brown, uh, John Brown had won it, the amateur, I think like a year before. I said, oh, Okay, I'll go to Fresno and, you know, hang out and train with her and practice some posing and uh, give John Brown credit. He's the one that did the first couple's routine for us. He put together the moves and all this transitioning stuff. So we won the first in 1982, 1982, and then we won again in 83. I had like four different partners because Shelly had gone on and do something over her life. And then I think it was uh, Carla Dunlop. Mm-hmm. Another great name. Right, yeah. So we won a couple of times, 84, 88, and then uh, Juliet Bergman. Oh, wow. No, no, no. Tina Plackinger, Tina Plackinger. Okay. Yeah, so we won 85, and then Juliet, we won 86. So, so yeah, the mixed pairs was a, was a, was a big deal uh, because I think people like to watch a couple, you know, couples posing together. It's almost like a band, basically. And we were not really big. You know, the bodybuilders were not that big on television. You know, so I think it was more pleasing to watch. But you know, Lisa is a pioneer in all of this. She's she's definitely legendary, and uh, get credit where credit is due. So, I was terrified, but it worked out. And I go, God, what am I doing? Why am I posing? Because you know, back in the seventies, you know, girls was not really in the gym working out. That was not fashionable at all. But Lisa, yeah. 
is the first one who walked in, kicked the door in, walked to those gyms and says, I'm going to, could I join up? I want a membership. And wow. they gave her a membership. She was deadlifting. She weighed about 115 pounds, so she's deadlifting 225. I mean, she's really strong. Nice. So, yeah. So one day I, I walked into Go's gym, and all the guys got their pictures on the wall. They had Robbie, Zine, blah, blah, blah. And who did I see picture on the wall? Lisa Lyon. <laughs> and that center. Doing the most muscular pose, too. <laughs> wow. Nice. nice. Yeah. yeah That's pretty so. cool. Tony, so, who, who – go ahead, Vince. Go ahead, Sean. Go ahead. Uh, so, so who came up with the name, the uh, bodybuilding Michael Jackson? Okay, I was with uh, – had an uh, interview with Rick Wayne, Ricky Wayne. He was the editor-in-chief of Muscle and Fitness and Flex Magazine, the Weaver's office. So I go out to the Weaver's office, and I had my nose done. I guess you guys know that, 1984. Had my nose done because Michael Jackson, you know, it's – so I go to the guy and I took a picture of Michael. So can you, I want to look like Michael Jackson, you know. He goes, you have the structure of your face. You look like Michael Jackson. But he goes, I can do your nose, but it's not going to look like his because your face is a little bit fuller than his. But I'll do my best. So he did a pretty good job. And so I go for the interview with Rick Wayne. So Rick is writing his stuff, you know, but you know Ricky Wayne, very famous guy. And he stopped. He goes, you look like Michael Jackson. Oh, and from that point on, he just wrote it right into the to the article and published it, and it, and it just took off. That's pretty cool. Wow. That's pretty cool. That's excellent. I mean, you you had it like that's like I, I can't wait to uh, read the book and see the movie. Um, it's going to be awesome. This is so yeah. cool. Now, did you ever get a chance to train with uh, Tom Platts? No, but I have so much respect for Tom Platts. You know he. And speaking of Tom Platz, with the WBF, he's yes. the guy that found me in Germany. You know, I was the guy, people go, where, where is he living these days and where is he? I was always the mystery man. But Tom Platz found me. He goes, and he got me into the WBF. We'll talk about that later. But Tom Platz at Gold's Gym, 1977, 1978, was really prime time, 1979. This was really the hardcore every champion in the world in the same gym at the same time, training like maniacs. And we would turn that Rocky song on. Rocky had just came out. So the whole gym went to the, to the theaters to watch that Rocky, Rocky won. So Kent Keane was a manager at the front desk. And every day he would walk in, turn to me, dun, 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 dun. So the gym's going crazy. So Tom Platt's over in the corner, training like a beast, like a madman. You know, he's doing dumbbell presses, squatting, hack squatting, you name it. We all were, but he was except he was over the top. <laughs> I mean, he would just kill himself, and so he really improved his body. I mean, drastically. One year, he really changed. He put everything he had into it. So, yeah, nothing. Hats off to Tom Platts. The guy's a great guy, great champion, very supportive, very humble. You know, he's a good guy. So, the whole everybody the, at the gym at the time was they were like we were like a family. We would go and eat restaurants. We would go to those places where you can eat all you all you can eat places. Yep. To the point they're throwing us out. You guys can't come back. <laughs> <laughs> so we did a lot of that, a lot of training, and um, go to the movies together. So yeah, it was it was it was like a family, like a big family. But when it came to the workout, it was serious. It was serious. So I mean, Robert walked through the door and don't speak to no one, straight to the machine. And because mentally he's preparing himself for the workout before he got there. Same here. I do that now. I'm on the way to the gym. Don't talk to me. It's not. It's, it's not good to be around me before the workout because I am really focused on what I'm going to do when I get there. I got one hour, and I'm going to use that hour to the max. So it doesn't take two hours to work out. Because oh, I trained for two and a half hours. Doing what? Because your muscles can only pump for a certain amount of time. Yep. So if you got thirty to forty seconds to one minute between sets. You can you get a great pump. Anything past that, an hour and a half, two hours, way too long. Yeah. So you bet you can't tell the young people. I try to help them at the gym. They just look at me like, "Old timer." <laughs> so, <laughs> they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. But they're going to regret it because if you don't build a foundation now, you're never going to build a foundation. Foundation means basic training. That yeah, doesn't squat. exist today. Deadlift, squat, T-bar, hardcore movements. Serious movement, painful movement. 
You know, a guy who doesn't have a great back, they don't have my respect. Because you have to work. To get a great back, you have to, unless you're genetically gifted, you have to really work, work hard. How did Robbie get his back? George Turner told me before he went to California, he had two sets of dumbbells, 110-pound dumbbells. And Robbie Robbins would do 10 sets of 10 every day. Wow. Dumbbell deadlifts. So when he got to California, he had this amazing back. Chisels, sculpted. Size, thickness, muscle separation, even striations. Mm. So that's, that's, that's the hard work. That's respect. Because when a guy turns around, Ronnie Coleman, that's the back. Yeah, crazy. That's the back. It's deep, it's cut, it's striated, and his lats tied, ties down to his hips. That's the back. So, you know, bodybuilding, you know, from the front, everybody can match. So when you turn around, that's, yep. that's, what it, that's what it counts. That's why I say contests are won from the back. Yes, and it's so true. I mean, you know who did their homework and who didn't, who's pretending. 100%. Thank you. 100%. <laughs> I can totally agree with you. Um, listen, so as we start winding down here, um, how can people reach you? With, for personal training, like what's your Instagram, your Facebook? Uh, Instagram is Tony Pearson 87 and Facebook is just Tony Pearson. Uh, I have a website, Tony Pearson, personal training.com. So those are the best ways. I live in Vegas. The best way to reach me. Um, that's about it. So yeah. What gym do you train at in Vegas? I train at anytime fitness. Really? Wow. Okay. <laughs> you know, it, personally for me, I kind of detach from the bodybuilding scene, the world. When I have to go there, I go there. When, you know, I could be that guy, but normally I'm not that guy. So this is relaxed, easy going, laid back. Most of the people are over 50, you know, just want to get in shape, just want to tone up, build their body, be healthy. And I like that situation. You know, I don't walk in the gym every day and I got to, you know, be that guy. I don't want to be that guy. I'm the guy with a hood on the corner hiding. I don't want to be seen. So I stay away. I'll pop in for a minute. And when they do go in, they all look at me like, like a ghost, like I'm a ghost. <laughs> so, yeah. So, no, I try to separate the two. I mean, real life, normal life for me, just, you know, everyday life. So, you know, I don't try to live. I'm not a bodybuilder every day. Let's put it that way. Gosh. Vegas is the hot spot now. Everybody seems to be coming from Venice Beach and everything else. Every day, somebody big is opening the gym out in Vegas somewhere. Yes, it's the mecca. You got you got Dragon Lear. You got you got um, Powerhouse. You know a lot of there's the a pros. new one called Tortured that just opened up this week. Yes, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> Neil Sarchev has been posting it like crazy. I don't know yeah. what it is, but in Vegas, in yeah, Vegas called it's literally called Torture Gym or Tortures Gym. Never heard of it. Okay, it's brand new. Yep. Yes. Then last week it opened up on Friday. Okay. See another one. <laughs> you got to go there and torture yourself. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So, oh, so I, Tony, I, I, it, it's been a pleasure listening to you, and um, I and I know for myself, as Sean, I can speak on his behalf. That we're going to be really excited to uh, see the movie and the audio and in the book. Um, thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank you. I appreciate being on. You guys are and great. And Andrew, of course, if anybody wants to hire you for any services, please publish. I mean, talk about yourself. Oh, yeah. So I can't wait for the movie to be out uh, where you get to see Tony being put into some uncomfortable situations like uh, putting him in Gold's gym and having people actually recognize him, even though he doesn't like that. <laughs> Um, you can follow me on Instagram. Uh, my handle is Director Menji. You can see that's my last name there, Menjivar. Um, or you can follow uh, my production company, Tequila Mockingbird Productions. That's Tequila Mockingbird Prod on Instagram. Um, and just keep it tuned there because we're going to be making some announcements in the next couple of, of weeks to see, you know, what's going to be happening with the documentary and, you know, what's the status and what, where it's, where it's moving and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I'm excited to show this whole movie off. Yes, we awesome. are as well. But again, it's, it's truly been an honor, you know, hopefully you'll come back and cause I know there's so many stories still untold and hopefully you'll come back after the movie is, is out and we can discuss that further. 
Um, but to both of you, thank you so much for taking time this evening. Thank you. And Andrew, thank I just you. followed you. Thank oh, you thank much. you. Thank you so much. I just followed you. And this Wednesday, folks, we have Porter Cottrell joining us Wednesday at 7. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Tony. All right, thank thank you, you. All right. Bye-bye. Nice. <laughs>